Hi, everybody. This is Leo Tonkin, founder and CEO of Salt Chamber. And I'd like to welcome you all to our next web class series, which is all about Himalayan salt decor, products, and spa equipment. Um, so we want to kind of give you a little peek behind the curtain, so to speak, about what you really need to know, since there seems to be a lot of myth information and certain perceptions about Himalayan salt decor, the products, and some of the spa equipment. So a little history about Himalayan salt. Um, it was formed more than 500 million years ago. So those of you that want to look it up into how old of this was, it, it really was an ancient inland sea that slowly began to evaporate, leaving behind this big mineral deposit area. And as the earth started to shift, literally, this became sealed inside underground under some intense pressure. And as the continents shifted, the rocks surrounding actually formed the mountain ranges that exist today. And so these salt deposits actually were discovered by Alexander the Great uh, back in 326 BC, when one of the soldiers noticed one of his horses actually licking the salt rocks. Thus where we got some of the salt licks that are out there. But anyhow, centuries later, the emperor introduced the standard salt mining in the Kura salt mines, which is where the Himalayan salt is. And in 1827, they really started to develop a sustainable way which is more of a what they call a room and pillar, where they went demolishing all of the mines itself. Uh, they would do rooms in, in carve out areas, and that really gave the basic uh, ways that they started to do the mining. And it's still harvested today, utilizing these same methods. Now, where Kirwa is, is where you see the dot over here. And so where you see all the way to the right where Nepal is, that's really where the Himalayas are. Um, where Kirwa is at is really is in Pakistan. Um, and when they were first coming to market, they realized that the name Himalaya would have had a lot more significance from a branding perspective, which is why today it's still called Himalayan salt. Um, so that's where it, it comes from. And there's a lot of different places that uh, say that they uh, produce and, and, and you know, mine the salt, but really it's just this one region where there's really only four mines within the Kira region. And it's taken us a while to really develop a relationship in, in a way that really makes sure that what we are getting is really the best quality of the Himalayan salt. And the, where we get it from directly is from uh, direct from the mining uh, company that has licenses there, where their FDA, their compliance with the Bioterrorism Act, they take care of their employees. In fact, they give back to the community. So um, we take a lot of pride in the relationships that we have where they are mining this beautiful uh, salt product that we've been utilizing for the most part as a decor element in salt rooms, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but, you know, they basically are mining the salt, and this is where all of the Himalayan salt comes from in the world. Now, we talk about these trace elements and minerals, and most salts, you know, there's all types of salts from all over the world. And like Himalayan salt, they basically, for the most part, are mostly sodium chloride. Um, there's some levels of calcium and potassium and magnesium, some of typical salt products in terms of elements that are included. Um, but when you look at the marketing about saying that there's 84 trace minerals and elements in Himalayan salt, which makes it so healthy, which is part of the marketing, you're really only talking about two and a half to 3% of that being trace minerals. So all of the 75 plus other minerals that they're talking about really is such a small amount. It's 0.0001% or less. So to market Himalayan salt about all these trace minerals and elements 
they really mean trace. They're very small amounts. Now, there's been a lot of ways that people have been utilizing Himalayan salt. Many people are familiar with it just from using it instead of regular table salt. Um, it's the kind of salt that I use all day long too in cooking. Um, people are now realizing when you take a slab of Himalayan salt, uh, what we would call like a brick or a tile, you can actually grill on it um, on, a, on a barbecue or in the oven. So there's some really cool, cool ways of how Himalayan salt is being utilized. Obviously, you still have horse and animal licks that uh, love the salt. Uh, there is a Soleil uh, water that you drink um, with saturated salt that has promised to uh, regulate pH balances in the body. Um, there's even tequila shot glasses that have been made out of Himalayan salt. So there's been a lot of creativity, and over the years, the marketing of Himalayan salt really has become something in a lot of products that you can buy today. Um, there's also the whole bath, spa, and beauty arena where the Himalayan salt is being utilized uh, in a very healthy way where you have exfoliation bars, bath salts, uh, salt scrubs, even the mud mask, which comes from the dirt where the salt is being mined from, is very condensed and rich in a lot of different uh, qualities. So a lot of uses for Himalayan salt. But I think what makes Himalayan salt as popular as it has been has come from the salt lamps that are out and marketed that many people are familiar with or even have in your homes or in your facilities. Um, some also po got popular around uh, the domes and Himalayan salt stones in terms of utilizing for massages. Um, but there's a big difference between Himalayan salt and what is called salt therapy. And so while various Himalayan products were gaining a lot of attention and more awareness and marketing was being generated, there was also a new modality being introduced to the spa and wellness industry. And that modality actually evolved from speleotherapy and is known today as dry salt therapy, what we call halo therapy. Halo being the word in salt in Greek. Now, where halo therapy really was evolved from was actually under the ground salt mines, but not in the Himalaya area in Pakistan, but in Europe, there are salt mines as well that they were mining um, for their product in use. And the physicians of that time realized that the workers in the mines were healthy, the ones that were, were inhaling the salt dust. And so the doctors in the 1800s started to realize that in these hollowed out salt areas, they were able to have people come and get well. And they would spend from a few hours a day to several days where people were in these salt mines or salt caves as they also became known. And that was called speleotherapy, which is breathing underground in these particular environments. And so in the 1900s, they started to have some of the very first health resorts in the underground salt mines. Uh, some of these exist today, like in the Walliska area in Poland, outside of Krakow. So a lot of um, interesting things started to happen. Uh, and so the Russians wanted to figure a way to replicate and mimic this salt particles that were in the air. And they were the ones that developed the very first halo generator, which is a device that crushes and grinds salt and disperses it into a room. And thus, that became known as halo therapy, what we refer to as dry salt therapy. So you've heard about salt rooms, some people call them caves and a lot of different ways, but basically what a salt room is, is adding a halo generator that sucks in air into itself. Uh, it has pure sodium chloride that goes into the halo generator that gets ground into these micro-sized particles and disperses it into the room. 
And that's what people are there breathing and getting onto their skin. And that's where all of the efficacy comes from. So you have this device called the halo generator, and it gets mounted onto one of the walls of the salt room with a sleeve coming through into the room. And that's where the salt therapy comes from. And so most halo generators are designed the same way, where there's a feeder and a grinder and a fan that actually puts the salt into the room. So you put salt into it, grinds it up, and this is what disperses it into the room. Thus, that's what a salt room is all about. So the first salt rooms that started to happen in North America were designed primarily by the Europeans. And the decor and the style was based on trying to replicate what it was like in Europe being down underground. So there were these rock salt walls that they started to put and put onto the walls and the floor. And those were some of the very first salt rooms that were happening here in the United States, as you see here as pictures. But again, this was just the initial decor side of things. All of the benefit from dry salt therapy comes from the halo generator. They were just being designed as salt rooms in there to give it kind of a theme for being underground in these mines. So around 2010, 2012, it was just, there was just a handful of companies that were actually doing anything around salt therapy. And less than about 20 salt rooms, I would say, back at that time. In 2012, when Salt Chamber was created, we started to really under, I, you know, we started to realize that there's other ways that you could design and utilize decor. And so we started to really look at how we could use the Himalayan, Himalayan salt as an architectural and decor feature. And so that's where we started our business model as we were designing salt rooms uh, and, and introducing other new concepts like our salt beds and our salt booths. So we were the ones that really put the panels onto the market in the industry. Our Himalayan panels are molded from Himalayan salt in various grain, pebbles, and chunk sizes. And they could be backlit, they could be put on the walls, lots of possibilities, including even doing customized logo treatments with utilizing the salt. This is what we referred to as our Himalayan panels. We also were developing ways of utilizing the Himalayan salt as bricks, like you would as a architectural element. And when you backlight them, there was very unique color colorations, if you will, of the translucency of this material. And so we started to develop unique ways for building these walls, as well as incorporating the halo generator that would come into the room to disperse the salt air into the salt room. So we really spent a lot of time perfecting all kinds of ways of installing and designing various types of salt rooms, utilizing this Himalayan salt as a decor. And we were doing, you know, space planning and facilities. And so the growth of the salt therapy industry really started to take on over the last few years. And so at the same time, we were the ones that first introduced the very first salt bed and the salt booth, which was a different way of offering a more private way of having a salt therapy session uh, that actually took a lot less time. So the larger the room, the more time you need to spend in being in the salt air. Conversely, when you have a smaller air space, you don't need as much time in a session in a booth. It could be as little as 10 minutes. So we started to introduce a lot of interesting things. And one of the things we found out was that um, the salt bed was a unique idea. And we started to partner with other uh, spa equipment company to develop and utilize the Himalayan salt. However, without putting the halo generator on the room, you really weren't getting any other benefit. It really was a unique way 
to maybe offer a, a way of having another massage or multi-purpose room that now you can have a halo generator and do multiple things inside of that room with some of the spa equipment. So we started to look at and started to design and install a variety of different ways in how you could utilize Himalayan salt. And children's rooms were being done, that's Himalayan salt on the floor, much like you would have sand. Um, you had very large rooms that had Himalayan rocks and, and, and salt on the floor. You had very clean looks and utilizing both bricks and panels. And so a variety of different ways that spas and people in the wellness industry were developing and building salt rooms from utilizing white Himalayan salt to pink Himalayan salt, converting different rooms like a sauna or a Vichy room. So a lot of things started to happen in utilizing this Himalayan salt products. And it became more and more popular, where today there's over 675, if not more, salt providers with utilizing the halo generators as the what gives you the benefit. However, people have been utilizing the Himalayan salt as a decor element, from med spas, to on cruise ships, destination spas, and very unique ways that we've been able to come up with in just using it as a decor feature. Even the luxury home market, uh, you know, we've been building salt rooms for, converting and adding Himalayan salt to a sauna. Um, different ways that we are utilizing Himalayan salt in developing everything. But as you see, our halo generators are involved even though you have the salt there in the space. In fact, our newest salt and sound booth is utilizing backlighting of the Himalayan salt and offering chromotherapy and sound therapy. But without the halo generator, you really don't have any kind of benefit. It's all about having the halo therapy. And so without having a halo generator, there simply is no benefit both from a health or wellness perspective. So this is where there's been confusion, where there's been a lot of conversations and publications and advertisements and language that various people have been utilizing, particularly around heating up Himalayan salt, where they talk about all these types of negative ions and cleansing of the air, et cetera. And so this, I think, is where some of the confusion has come from. There are companies out there that talk about heating Himalayan salt and that it does certain benefits from it. And some of these claims that they're talking about are about releasing these negative ions into the atmosphere when it's heated. Now, keep in mind, a salt lamp is about a, a small wattage. Keep in mind that when you're backlighting the Himalayan salt, you're using LED lights that give off no heat. Even when you put Himalayan salt in a sauna room, that still is not heat where you're generating negative ions. However, what these companies have been claiming is that it generates and releases negative ions, it attracts moisture and dust in the atmosphere around, it cleanses and purifies the air, some even talk about how it reduces symptoms or improves breathing and reduces stress. Uh, so there's been a lot of things out there that people have been marketing and saying about Himalayan salt. And when I first heard about some of this, I really didn't know that, uh, you know, whether it was true or not. It was just kind of what was general knowledge. And then uh, we started to really investigate because we want everything that we do to have evidence to it. We want the evidence-based research about what halo therapy is all about. Even though we know that we are only utilizing Himalayan salt as a decor and architectural element. So as we started to do our research, we realized that there was all these studies out there. And first off, they are so many studies that talk about both negative and positive ions being in the air, if it impacts 
anything with the respiratory function. And the studies show that it just doesn't. It may impact a mental and emotional side of things where there's some benefit, but in terms of doing anything from a respiratory function, simply is not the case. Now, um, we all know that you know we have ions around us. There's a lot of electromagnetic frequencies, our HVAC systems and the quality of the air around. Um, and there's negative ions around in nature, by the ocean, by waterfalls and stuff. And while we try to recreate that feeling of being around negative ions, it's very difficult to recreate that, especially coming from heating up Himalayan salt. And there's been absolutely no scientific studies on that being able to produce negative ions. In fact, the few ions, if any, are very different than the kind that have been used for medical studies in terms of creating negative ion machines that put it into the environment. And so even uh, scientists are even looking and in, in, in doing their studies and saying there is no negative ions that are being emitted from this Himalayan salt. In fact, one of the chemists that was involved says that because sodium chloride is such a stable uh, element where the sodium and chloride molecules are, are very tight and stable, it would take a tremendous amount of heat to really break up the sodium chloride to create the negative ion, which the heat talks about it being at 1500 degrees. So having a, a small watt light bulb in a lamp or a dome, or heating up Himalayan salt in a sauna, or massage stones being heated up, nothing is happening in terms of generating any negative ions. Now, people also talk about that the Himalayan salt and like the lamps and such act as a super absorbent uh, type of product that eliminates and, and absorbs the allergens in the, in, in the dust and molecules around the air. And while there's some level of humidity in most air conditioned spaces, for that water vapor to attract and stick to the surface of the Himalayan salt is very questionable. Um, some pollutants might by chance stick to some humidity inside of a room, but there's none in a sauna, for example, very, very uh, dry, right? And so same thing with uh, salt decor. Uh, the salt in the Himalayan salt on the floor or on the walls or however it's utilized really doesn't do any kind of absorption. Uh, it doesn't filter out anything. So there's been a lot of myth information out there, if you will. And the Salt Therapy Association in their uh, inaugural conference last year in September really had over 250 attendees there and really communicating this information. And again, there was some articles that were written about this that were also published not that far after the conference about the myth about how Himalayan salt has all these special magical properties and how it provides wellness. And what we've learned is, is that where all of the wellness comes from is from halo therapy, not from Himalayan salt. It's with the halo generator. And Himalayan salt really is only there as a decor. And while there's some evidence, when you have a large amount of any kind of an element, uh, all elements have a certain vibrational frequency, whether it's quartz or amethyst or even Himalayan salt. So there could be a little difference in terms of the feeling inside of the room. And there's some that actually say that the color, uh, the, the, the nice orange and amber and pink hues create a soothing environment. And there's a lot of science around chromotherapy and color therapy. However, there's absolutely no evidence that heating Himalayan salt, whether it's a lamp, a wall, in a sauna, massage stones, or anything else, is releasing negative ions or cleaning the air. Um, it really is nothing to do with it other than creating 
a beautiful and nice environment. In fact, you don't need to have any decor inside of a room, excuse me, you don't need any Himalayan salt or any salt to have a salt room. In fact, we are designing salt rooms today utilizing a lot of various different materials now. Now recently, there was actually an article where this is now becoming more of a serious issue. So salt facilities or people that are providing halo therapy need to make sure that they're not referencing any benefit from the Himalayan salt since right now in federal court, there's actually a class action lawsuit against one of these companies that were making claims about the benefits of Himalayan salt. So you really want to understand that halo therapy is all about the dry salt therapy. It's pure grade sodium chloride that gets put into the halo generator. It's not Himalayan salt either. It's not dead sea salt. It's not Epsom salts. There's a lot of various salts out there. A lot of therapies utilize various salts. But the salt rooms that we're talking about is all about having a halo generator and dispersing the dry salt particle aerosol into a room. That's really where all the difference comes from. Um, so you really don't need salt to have a salt room, but you do need to have a halo generator. Um, all other materials basically are fine to be in a salt room. While some believe salt to be corrosive, that is true when it becomes wet or it's involved with moisture. But we're talking about dry salt. So you can have other types of finishes. It does no damage to the walls or the ceiling or to paint. Uh, stone, concrete, uh, all natural products, wood, all are fine materials in terms of looking at the core and uh, architectural elements. Um, how do you clean the salt room? Well, that's great. Uh, in, you know, great question that we often get when people are putting uh, Himalayan salt on the floor for an effect. Um, pretty much you clean that out like you would a fish tank with a vacuum cleaner with a screen on it. But keep in mind, salt's antibacterial. And so there's really not a lot of uh, anything to be, quote, dirty inside of a salt room. The salt aerosol can get onto things because it's dry salt and creates a dusting. So salt rooms are typically clean in between sessions by brushing down the seats. But in terms of the walls or anything else, if you have salt in there, there's not much cleaning to do at all. It's very low maintenance. Um, Himalayan bricks and how much do the panels cost? Um, they're gonna range depending on the sizes and qualities of the salt bricks that you have. So sometimes that by the square footage, they can be anywhere around $35 to $50 a square foot. The Himalayan panels that we manufacture are 22 inches by 22 inches, almost four square feet. And that becomes about, on average, about $100 a panel, depending on the, which materials and which quantities. So there's some differences there. Um, but if you were to look at uh, the types of products that are out there and you're Googling pricing, you're gonna see retail prices for some of these salt bricks in the neighborhood of 10 to $18 a brick. Um, I think you need to be aware that there's a lot of bricks that are out there that are good for cooking, but when you're talking about architectural grade, you wanna make sure that you are getting accurate and precise cut bricks, which is what we provide, to make the installations more timely and less costly. So you wanna, if you're shopping around and you want some more information around it, that's what you wanna be able to do and understanding the quality of the color, the quality and the preciseness of where it's cut. We often on some of our own installations have to take the bricks and we sort them out in terms of the right color. And that's what we provide for our customers as well. So uh, to get additional information about salt therapy and the benefits from it, I strongly recommend that you visit the Salt Therapy Association and find out uh, how salt therapy works. Uh, you can look at one of our other web classes that we offer that are on-demand webinars on our website. Um, and if you'd like to talk about a design or a particular salt room that you're working on and want some and utilize some of our design and decor services or our 
somebody that wants to work with an architect or a contractor and understanding some of the installation, please schedule a, a phone call. I'll be happy to talk with you. Other than that, I thank you for paying attention and listening and making sure that you understand the difference between Himalayan salt and halotherapy. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.